Hi everyone, my name is Brody Fogelman. And I am Jessica O'Neill. We are both TAs for BME 209 and 219 labs this year. From our experiences with teaching this course, we have noticed that many students either have never written a formal lab report or have had minimal exposure with scientific writing up until this point in their academic careers. And just like you, we had minimal exposure writing formal lab reports until our second year in college. We understand your struggles, and this is one of the reasons that we are making this video in the first place. We urge you to, one, review this video in its entirety, two, heavily review the lab report rubric and understand what is expected of you and how you will be evaluated, and three, never hesitate to ask questions or for clarification from your TA. So why is this so serious, you ask? Well, for many of your courses beyond this one, you will be asked to submit formal lab reports and scientific reviews of literature and academic writing. Specifically, the more work and dedication you put into these lab reports, the better prepared you will be for next year for Human Physiology 1 and 2. First, let's look at the grading breakdown of a lab report for BME 209 or 219. You'll be evaluated on seven overarching criteria categories. These categories are cover page format, page length, introduction, methods, results, discussion, and your overall writing quality. Your cover page is worth 1% of your overall lab report grade. Okay, so that should be easy, right? You would think so, but there are many students who lose points like these just because of not following basic directions, so please make sure you follow these exactly. Next is the page length. For each of your lab reports, you are allowed up to a maximum of five pages. Note that I said maximum. This does not mean that each of your lab reports should be five pages in length. If you can get all of the necessary information on one page, that is awesome. However, I promise that will not happen. The majority of your lab reports should fall within the range of three to five pages. As long as it is five pages or less, you will receive all 10 points. Note that the cover page is not included in the page count. And before we get to the more rigorous details of the lab report, let's talk about writing quality. We understand that you are future engineers, scientists, researchers, and healthcare experts, not English language and rhetoric experts. As long as an average person can understand what you are writing, you should receive all 10 points for this category. However, mistakes that cause the grader to stop reading because they are distracted will cause you to lose points in this section. Here's my advice. Once you write a section of your lab report, edit it. Once you think you are done with your lab report, read it over one or two more times to make sure it makes logical sense, that it flows, and that there are no obvious spelling or grammar mistakes that could make your reader confused or lead to a misunderstanding. Although I figure you already assume this, I want to make it clear that all lab reports should be written in standard English. Checkpoint question one, true or false? The example cover page for a formal lab report to the right will receive full credit. Click pause to review the cover page to the right and decide if you think the statement is true or false. What'd you choose? Did you say true? Hopefully not. This statement is false. The student would not receive full credit for their cover page because it does not clearly indicate their name. Checkpoint question two. A student neglects to include subheadings and uses I and we in their formal lab report. Which grading assignment would you expect that this student's writing quality be placed in by the grader? Choose A, B, C, or D. Click pause and think about which grading category this student should expect to be placed in. The correct choice is A, not addressed. As indicated by the grading rubric in category Writing Quality, a student that uses first-person pronouns and does not use subheadings should be placed in the not addressed category thereby converting to about zero to two points maximum for this category. Now for the introduction of the lab report. The introduction is worth a total of 10 points, five points for the broad contextualization of why you are performing the experiment, and five points for the accuracy and relevance of your introduction. Your introduction should be about two to three paragraphs for many of the lab reports in this course. However, this varies with the experiment that is being performed. Basically, you want to make sure that you cover all of the background that is necessary for someone not in the biomaterials field to understand what you are doing and why you are doing it. Here, you are the expert. The graders are the outsiders you are writing to. If what you are doing is relevant to pharmacology, include that explanation. If what you are doing is relevant to biomechanics, include that explanation. 
There are many applications for the experiments that you will perform in this course, even if that is only observing them through the computer screen. In this section, you, are, you really want to answer the question, in what way is this information important and who is it important for? Additionally, you will want to give the reader background information that will help them with understanding the experimental goals and discussion later in your report. If you are talking about an alginate gel and its importance to your experiment, explain what it is. If you are using a crosslinker in your experiment and it is an integral part of your experimental hypothesis or central claim, explain what it is and what it does. Just act like you are writing this for someone that is new to the field of biomaterials and biomedical engineering. As always, don't get too carried away in this section. Under no circumstance should your introduction exceed a page for any of the lab reports in this course. If we expect them to be over a page, your TA will directly communicate that with your section. This is also where you should include your hypothesis about the experimental procedure you are conducting or observing. Next, let's talk about the methods and experimental design. This portion is worth a total of 20 points. 10 for discussing and explaining your controls and 10 for the experimental design. As you have already learned or will soon learn from your TA, the controls from the experiment are highly important. In this lab, you will be expected to not only identify your controls, but sometimes consider how useful they are or if there needs to be more of them in order to draw logical and scientifically supported claims from the data you have collected. Not only do you need to identify your controls, you'll also need to explain the importance of them. You must identify and explain all of your controls. Additionally, you will need to explain what you did and how you did it. Simply listing out your methods and experimental protocol will, own, will earn you only about 0 to 2 points out of the 10 possible points. You'll need to actually write, in paragraph form, what you did and how you did it. If I were to read your methods section, I should be able to perform the experiment on my own without outside references or help from you. Checkpoint question 3. Student X sets up a meeting with a TA to ask why the TA deducted points from their lab report. The student's methods section is to the right. Why did the student lose points on this section? Click pause and see if you can find where student X messed up. What do you see wrong with this section? Among many problems with this student's methods section, I hope you noticed that this method section is written in a list format. Your method section should always be written in paragraph form to earn full credit. Secondly, the student did not describe what their controls were or why the controls for the experiment were important. Next is the results section. This section is made up of three criteria, data selection, data presentation, and statistical analysis. Each of the criteria here are worth 10 points, totaling 30 points for this section. Regarding the data selection portion of the results section, you will be evaluated on your ability to accurately convey meaning with numbers, tables, graphs, charts, and pictures. The data you provide in your lab report should have some meaning. If it is meaningless, then it probably shouldn't be a part of your lab report. Regarding data presentation, you should have all of your data properly labeled with a title and corresponding figure number. For example, if I have three tables of data, I will label them figure one, figure two, and figure three. You can numerically label your data in any way you choose, as long as, as it is consistent throughout your report. Each figure you have should have a caption that accurately describes the data being reported. All graphs should have labeled axes with units and have an appropriate title. Regarding statistical analysis, you should show any calculations you did in a professional manner that allows the reader to understand how you manipulated data that you will use to make a decision of rejecting your hypothesis or failing to reject your hypothesis. For example, if you calculate a t-test statistic, we do not expect you to show the mechanism by which you arrived at it, only that it is clear which values were used in the calculation and any programs or softwares you used. Additionally, you should always clearly indicate the p-value you are using as significant. In this class, you will mostly compare your calculated t-test statistics to a p-value of less than 0.05 to indicate that a value is statistically significant. Why? Because this is the most common p-value used as a measure of validity in the BME field and many other scientific research fields. Checkpoint question four. Student G submits this graph as part of their formal lab report. What are the two fundamental problems associated with student G's graph on the right? 
click pause to see if you can identify the two fundamental flaws with this graph. Unfortunately, student G did not include a descriptive title. Recall that all data should have a descriptive title and corresponding figure number for easy reference. Secondly, the student neglected to include units on their x-axis. Thus, by first glance, it may be difficult for the reader to interpret what meaning this graph actually has. Always remember to label and include units on all axes. Last is the discussion. The discussion section is worth a total of 19 points and is split into four grading categories. First, let's look at conclusions based on data interpretation. In this portion, we are looking for you to explain how your data supports a conclusion you are drawing. This should be logical and reasonable within the parameters of the experiment conducted. Here you basically want to persuade the reader that your data seriously supports the claims you are making. You also want to include things such as new insights from the data obtained. Is there something odd about your data that you do not understand? Explain it. Does it contradict another theory of science? Explain how or why. Next, you'll want to address alternative explanations. Note that this is not just a reiteration of the limitations of the experiment. We will discuss that next. Alternative explanations are used to rule out other reasons for observed outcomes. You want to use this place to cl clearly explain why other possible conclusions that others might deduce from this data are incorrect or not justified by the data you have collected. At the end of the discussion, you want to end up at a logically derived reason for why you have chosen to fail to reject or reject your hypothesis. Next are the limitations of your design or experimental protocol. You, you'll need to make sure that the limitations you are presenting in this section are parallel with the conclusions you are drawing. There are many limitations to any experiment or research study, so you'll want to include a few here. Of course, they all, should all come within, with explanations. The last part of the discussion section is the implications of your study. You should directly indicate how these conclusions and supporting evidence can relate to a field within BME, a specific research interest, or even in another field of engineering or science. Checkpoint question 5. True or false? All experiments I conduct or observe will have experimental limitations. Click pause and think about this for yourself. The correct answer is true. Nearly all experiments you conduct as a student, graduate student, or professional will have limitations. Therefore, in order to draw scientifically sound conclusions, you should always remember to adequately identify and explain how these limitations either have little impact or large impacts on your study and the conclusions you are making. Checkpoint question 6. True or false? Alternative explanations are the same as experimental limitations. Click pause and think about the relationship between experimental limitations and alternative explanations that we addressed previously in this video. The correct answer is false. Although this may or may not seem obvious to you right now, many students fail to recognize this difference and thereby fall to the trap of losing many points because of not truthfully understanding this difference. Recall that alternative explanations should be used to evaluate the outcomes of an experiment or observation. You should always try to rule out other alternative explanations to the outcomes of the study that you are seeing or analyzing in order to further enhance the validity of your conclusions. Experimental limitations are internal or external factors of the experimental design that may either bias or change an outcome of a particular study. For example, if you use faulty equipment in the first half of your experiment, but then a new piece of the same equipment in the second half of your experiment, this change could result in faulty outcomes. Human error, in all of its forms, is also a very common experimental limitation. Lastly, make sure to not use first-person pronouns throughout the entirety of your lab report. You'll receive points off if you make that mistake. And with that, we have it. I hope that this video has been helpful for you and that it clearly communicates what we expect from you in your lab reports. In normal semesters, we would require you to submit both a hard copy and an electronic copy. However, in order to do our part in mitigating the spread of COVID-19, you will only be required to submit your lab report to the online Moodle locker that is designated for each assignment. As always, 
If you have any questions or concerns about your lab report or the lab in general, please reach out to your TA for assistance. We understand the struggle of online learning, especially for a lab that is intended for you to learn to use specific instruments. We are here to support you and enable you to learn biomaterials related information and skills that will be needed as you progress through your academic career in biomedical engineering. Be healthy, safe, and let us know if you need anything at all.